I'll refer to this Islander Northport watch as the Ripper. I'll be reviewing the blue to white Ripper model number ISL195. I bought the Ripper with my own money for $440. Before I start, I'd like to honor David McGee, who was born in Cork, Ireland on this day in 1835. McGee was both the first and last watch reviewer to give a bad review of a watch he had received free from a watch company. McGee died penniless shortly afterwards, despised by the watch industry and despised by the public for not giving the watch the glowing review that the idiot masses had come to expect. Northports come in two different styles of bracelets, the Jubilee style, which my Ripper has, and an Oyster style bracelet. The Northport case can use both bracelet styles interchangeably. I also purchased the Northport's Oyster style bracelet and will be showing you how my Ripper looks on the Oyster style bracelet. The primary focus of this review will be on the Jubilee style bracelet that the Ripper comes with. The Ripper's design is derived from the Seiko 62 MAS, which has been reissued by Seiko as the outrageously expensive SPB-143. According to LIW, the Northport's bracelet should be compatible with the SPB-143 as well. This interoperability with the SPB-143 is a feature that really makes the Ripper stand out above the crowd of other 62 mass copycats. If you're interested in the SPB-143, I encourage you to watch the Mad Watch Review's review of it, or you can lend me your SPB-143 for review. I'd really be interested to see how the Northport's bracelet fits on the SPB-143. I'll cover and fully ensure shipping. The Ripper fits wrists up to eight and a half inches. The Ripper's bracelet uses screw pins. Yay! It's 20 millimeters in width. The bracelet and clasp appear to be nearly identical to this larger 22 millimeter strap code bracelet I bought several years ago. Strap code is a maker of aftermarket bracelets. It wouldn't surprise me if the Ripper's bracelet was made in the same factory as the strap code bracelet. Both my strap code bracelet and clasp are superb and industrial strength. The Ripper bracelet and clasp also look to be durable and of high quality. There are some small details about the Ripper's bracelet and clasp that need to be addressed. The Ripper's Jubilee style bracelet is very tooly as far as Jubilee style bracelets go. It's entirely brushed, which I really like because it doesn't show scratches. It's flexible and wears well. The links have adequate thickness at three and a half millimeters. The bracelet is 20 millimeters in width. It tapers down nicely to 16 millimeters. The clasp is 19 millimeters in width. The Seiko 62 mask case is not a design that lends itself well to being easily integrated with any type of bracelet. While Jubilee style bracelets are my personal favorite style of bracelet due to their comfort, it's not hard to imagine the difficulty level of integrating a Jubilee style bracelet with a Seiko 62 mask style case. And I'm not accepting LIW for the issues which have arisen from this. The Ripper's bracelet uses female end links. This is good. It allows the case to conform to the wrist better. When I saw the Ripper's garish looking end links, I had to do a double take. The fake mid links on the end link look absolutely hideous. The Ripper is an exceptionally pretty watch and the fake mid links on the end links cheapen it. I'm deducting two points for this. My issues with the bracelet are solely based on cosmetic reasons. It otherwise appears to be an excellent bracelet. I give the bracelet a B. Here's the end link of the Oyster style bracelet. It's also female. I am 100% on board with how the Oyster style end link integrates with the case. Not only does the Oyster style end link look way better than the Jubilee, the case of the watch looks way better on an Oyster style bracelet than it does a Jubilee. The Ripper wears well on both styles of bracelets on my roughly seven inch wrist. Both bracelets have the same comfort level. 
Functionally, the clasp is excellent. I don't like the excess clearance on the edge of the micro-adjust side of the clasp. I'm deducting a point for this. The other side of the clasp is as it should be, offering virtually no clearance. I find it odd that my 22 millimeter strap code clasp doesn't suffer from this issue. Maybe the ripper bracelet and clasp aren't cut from the same cloth as my strap code. Mark, the president of LIW, says the following about the Ripper's clasp in his promo video. Micro adjust six positions on the clasp so you can definitely get that just right fit for you. I don't think Mark chose a clasp with six micro adjust positions to give his customers, quote, that just right fit, unquote as you achieve near maximum size and granularity with only three micro adjust positions. I think that it was probably cheaper and more convenient for Mark to buy a generic six micro adjust position clasp. The combined width of the micro adjust holes is vastly greater than the width of a single bracelet link. The Ripper's clasp is the watch equivalent of a clown wearing shoes that are way too big on him. I can almost forgive an aftermarket strap code bracelet for having six micro adjust holes, as it's meant to be generic. But the Ripper doesn't need to have more than three or four micro adjust holes. Like the Phoebus I reviewed recently, I'd like to see LIW move towards a clasp that caters the amount of micro adjust holes it has to the width of the Ripper's bracelet links. I realize that more expensive watches also have clasps with generic six micro adjust hall clasps. This doesn't make it right. I'm deducting a point for the Ripper's overly wide clasp. Despite the clasp being wider than it needs to be, it feels fine and seems very sturdy. I give the clasp a B. Like other older style dive watches, the crown lacks crown guards. The crown is grippy and easy to operate. The crown is very slightly recessed into the case. The crown feels nice and heavy and smooth. There's good crown pop. I don't have to fish around to find the crown positions. The Ripper has 200 meters of water resistance. You should be able to swim to your heart's content with the Ripper. I give the crown an A. The case is very reasonably sized and should fit people with a wide variety of wrist sizes. The case diameter is 40 and a half millimeters. The lug to lug or length is 46 and a half millimeters. The case width, including the crown, is 44 millimeters. The case thickness is 13 millimeters. This isn't overly thick, but it seems unusually thick for a watch that houses a movement that's only four millimeters thick. I'll cover the Ripper's movement later. I'm not going to bitch and moan about the 13 millimeter thickness because it might have to do with the interoperability with the Seiko SVB143's case. With exception to the Ripper's lack of crown guards, the Ripper has a modern style case with downturn lugs. The case is all brushed, with exception to the chamfers. I'm not going to deduct points for this, but the case back is pretty atrocious. It's a challenge for me to read the sloppily incised text on the case back. It looks really amateurish. The bezel lines up correctly. It not only feels great, but sounds great. I'm not sure if the Ripper uses a bezel insert. I'll refer to the half blue, half white colored area with black markings as the bezel ring. The bezel ring is covered with a flat sheet of sapphire crystal. The markings on the bezel ring are exceptionally sharp and use a really sexy font. The markings on the bezel ring aren't loomed, but the bezel ring is loomed. I'll cover loom at the end of the video. The bezel ring has no loom pip, which means that the Ripper doesn't meet the commonly held criteria for being a dive watch. For $440, I want a real dive watch with a triangular loom pip, or at least a loom pip that's clearly identifiable. The loom on the bezel ring isn't powerful enough to provide enough background light so that the markings are readable for a reasonable period of time yet it does have enough staying power to glow for hours. It is a useless glowing donut that has no function whatsoever. I find this to be stupid and gimmicky. I'm not six years old. I don't give a poop if my bezel ring glows all night so that I can show it to all the kids at summer camp. All I want is a loom pip that I can easily see when I set the timing bezel. I don't like that the bezel is polished. 
as you'll see when we get to the dial, polishing the bezel of a watch with a dial as striking as the Ripper makes no sense. The watch already draws a huge amount of attention to itself. I won't wear a watch like the Ripper because I don't want to be bothered by people telling me all day what a nice watch I have. The bling of the bezel's polish just makes the watch way louder than it needs to be. Also, the polish is not consistent with the Thule low-key brushed bracelet. Furthermore, the polish is going to be a sponge for scratches. I feel the polish on the bezel is a really bad design decision, but I'm not going to deduct points for this, as I don't deduct points for polish. I give the bezel a D. The sapphire crystal on the dial is flat. It'll never scratch. The crystal has anti-reflective coating. I don't notice any tint, which is my preference. I don't detect any issues with glare. I give the crystal an A. I'm going to rely on the camera to do the talking for me when I say that the Ripper has a really nice dial. The white rehot complements not only the dial, but the bezel ring. I really like the embossed black text on the dial. I've been bitching and moaning about LIW's logo for years. This time, LIW really got it right. The embossed logo and the addition of the Islander text under it works. The date is only partially readable. I'm deducting two points for this. If I buy a watch with a date, I need the date to be readable. For some reason, LIW refuses to make watches with readable dates. I like the indexes, I like the shape of the handset, but I don't like the plasticky looking material used for it. My Steel Dive Willard has a similar style handset. Steel Dive even gives me a really nice brushed looking handset that even has polished beveled edges. You can buy a date only version of this watch for under $100. If I'm buying a $440 watch, I sure as hell don't want a sub $100 watch's handset to run circles around it. I'm deducting a point for the plastic handset. Unfortunately, because of lack of attention to detail, I have to give this super nice dial a B minus. The Ripper has a Miyota 9015 movement. It's considered a high beat movement, which just means that its hands move more smoothly than your typical entry level movement. The 9015 has some pretty impressive accuracy for a movement that while not entry level is still reasonably cheap. Its range of accuracy is 10 seconds slow a day to 30 seconds fast a day. I've heard a lot of good things about the 9015, and my testing of this one reinforces what I've heard. It's running minus 4 seconds slow a day, crown down. It's also running minus 4 seconds a day, crown out. The Ripper comes with this screwdriver. It comes in your usual Islander watch box with the usual bent information card. Information about the one-year warranty is on the website. The loom on the Ripper's dial and handset was glowing very strong after three hours. As I mentioned earlier, there's no loom pip, and the loom on the bezel ring does not provide an adequate amount of light for the bezel ring's markers to be readable. You can't ask people to cough up $440 for a watch that specs like a dive watch, looks like a dive watch, and is modeled after a dive watch, yet isn't a dive watch because it lacks a loom pip. The bezel ring, at a minimum, should have had a triangle pip, even if it wasn't loomed. The fat dot indicating the zero marker isn't very identifiable. At $440, people deserve a real dive watch, not a pretty glowing toy. I give the Ripper an overall grade of C. I don't think the Ripper has much use beyond drawing attention from others. The image of the Ripper's stupid, useless, glowing donut on the bezel will unfortunately be indelibly etched into my memory. This is something I expect of a poorly made, cheap Chinese watch made five years ago.